when the producers came to me and asked me, hey, by the way, uh, in a few months we're going to do this other job and make sure you're available. I'm like, okay. And then when I found out it was the Joker, I was like, oh my God, the Joker. How the hell am I going to do that? I approach it like painting to make people interesting rather than beautiful. Hi, this is Nikki Ledermann and this is the timeline of my career. When I was little, I wanted to be an opera singer and I went to a performing high school of the arts in Germany, in Munich, and I truly thought I would become a musician. When I saw The Exorcist, that was really my turning point because, you know, when I saw just Linda Blair's head turn and I was like, how the hell did they do that? Or American Werewolf in London, like this whole incredible, rig that Rick Baker built and got an Oscar for with the wolf coming out of the guy's mouth. It was just so magical to me that I was like, how did they do that? The artistry in it, the emotions that it makes you feel, all that stuff that's all created by makeup, I thought it was so fascinating and I couldn't stop thinking about these, you know, scenes in all these cool movies that I saw when I was, you know, in my teens. I thought like, they don't make movies here like that. I would have to go to America. I was 20 years old and I left my home to live the American dream. My boyfriend at the time had this great idea, why don't you just go to NYU, put flyers out for the film students, offering your services, doing makeup on their thesis films. And that's exactly what I did. And the kids were so excited and we all kind of rose up together. My very first paid job, I shall say, was on a small TV show that was shot in Boston called Against the Law. That show ran for, I think, only a season. And we came back to New York. It was such great timing because early 90s then, we had this amazing, independent movie scene in New York. So my friend Derek, he called me up and said, listen, my buddy from NYU, he's directing this really amazing movie. It's called Palookaville. And he said, you, you have to work on this film. The script is amazing. So I met with a director and it's funny because I walked in, we met at Bubby's in, in, in Tribeca and I saw him sitting at, at this little corner booth and I looked at him and I'm like, I'm gonna marry that guy. Turns out we did get married and we did have three kids together. But you know, so working on Palookaville was like my first experience of like a real movie. The movie was a beautiful movie that we were all really proud of. It won awards. It was like my first movie that I've done that I really was very proud of. That little movie not only was a stepping stone into a really amazing career, but having three beautiful children. When I heard that Todd Solons, who previously directed Welcome to the Dollhouse, was doing another movie, I thought like, oh, this is great. I would love to work on it. He's such a funny, quirky, smart, talented guy. So they sent me the script. And when I was reading the script, I was like, oh my God. I thought it was so ballsy, so brave. I need to be part of it. That was like a wild experience that I'm grateful I had. My taste in the contributions that I am giving to in my work is I want to show the beauty in what people don't want to recognize or people don't want to deal with or people look down upon. It's that maternal instinct that I had even before having children to help make the underdog shine. I just broke up with my fiance, which trust me, is traumatic enough. And now I have 25 days to either find the money to buy my place or I am out on the street. When I started Sex in the City, it was a complete shift of working in the gritty reality and turning everything into the high fashion world that is special, that is art. Because fashion, if you think about it, is art. And that really helped me and my team to come up with really pretty beauty looks for our girls that are not as conventional. What our goal was to be the trendsetters and not being the followers of the trendsetters. What we try to do to try not to keep it as superficial as fashion sometimes seems to be is that the looks that we created are not looks that are unachievable. You have magazines where people are airbrushed and nothing is really real that you see. What we did was trying to create cool looks for everybody. 
It doesn't matter if you're pretty, it doesn't matter if you're a supermodel. Everybody can have those looks and we put the emphasis of uniqueness rather than beauty, which I thought was very interesting and very important because, you know, even the clothes, the hair, the makeup, it wasn't always like gorgeous, but it certainly was unique. And that was really the thing that kept us from like dropping into that superficialness because the uniqueness is an expression of personality. It's an expression of character and anybody can do that anybody and I have to say working with all my friends on that show we all kind of grew up on that show we all had children on that show it was like an incredible incredible run and that was really my breaking point when I thought to myself I made it as a makeup artist because of sex in the city do you have any other income besides the column no but I was chosen as New York magazine's best pick for city columnist good now give me saucy when we were filming Betty Page, as a makeup artist, I had a few challenges. We were shooting most of it in black and white and some of it in color. And when you shoot black and white, your application of makeup in terms of colors are very different. When you shoot color and you put like a really pretty red lipstick on, you see it's red. But when you put a red lipstick on, on black and white, it doesn't look like sometimes anything or sometimes it looks black. You have to really test all the colors that you're going to be using and shoot it on black and white so you know what it's going to look like. So you really had to experiment and practice a lot in terms of color application to get the shade right. What is really important is that you research what people actually really looked like at that time. Great, Betty. Great. When we did Devil Wears Prada and Hathaway's character Andrea had a really lovely evolution from the frumpy, normal, not caring about fashion kind of look into this high fashion Vogue girl. And that was really fun because you get to play, you get to try different things, you really change a look of a person. But the trick is really that you have to keep the essence the same. You can't just make somebody look completely different because no matter how much a person changes, the essence has to still be there. And in creating a makeup look, I felt the essence that I tried to keep in her is a little bit of that innocence in her by not overdoing it. So you kind of have to find the essence of that character and try to keep that throughout the whole movie. Otherwise, the change of the character is not believable. That movie was really fun because you had Valentino there and we created one of Valentino's fashion shows and that was really fun. That was a really great movie about fashion and makeup and hair and at the same time, there was a lesson in this and we wanted to make sure that that lesson is not lessened by overdoing it. I couldn't do what you did to Nigel Miranda. I couldn't do something like that. When we worked on Enchanted, we had this amazing scene that was taking place in the ballroom where Amy Adams had this gorgeous purpley dress on and I was so excited. I thought like, oh, I'm gonna make you look so gorgeous. You know, I was so excited. It's the ballroom scene, like Cinderella's ballroom scene. And so I did my thing and we went down to set and I realized, oh my God, what is this lighting? And oh my God, I should have checked first because you know what? Lighting is so incredibly important to my work as a makeup artist because it can break everything. And when Amy arrived on set, my gorgeous makeup was completely washed out and erased. I, I, I didn't recognize the colors in her face. She looked like she had like nothing on her face. And I'm like, we can't shoot her like that. She looks like a washed, out little girl I have to take it back into the makeup room and so I had to adjust her makeup with colors that I would never put on her normally but I had to adjust the colors so they can register in the light that they were using for that ballroom scene so I put like this crazy color weird kind of purpley pink on her lips and like gave her this strange blush that looked ridiculous in real life but on set it looked beautiful and that was my big lesson 
and I should have known better because I'm trained for that, right? That I need to make sure that I know exactly what the lighting is on set because the makeup can really look horrendous if I don't complement the lighting or vice versa too, you know? I'm gonna talk to Nagi. I don't know. Two years killing Jerry's doesn't exactly prepare you for a whole lot else. I love period projects because you can really paint, you can really like evoke a different era, a different time. It's like time traveling. It's so exciting to me. When I was called in to interview for Boardwalk Empire for the pilot that Martin Scorsese was directing, I was like, oh my God, I want to do this so bad. I want to work with Martin Scorsese, God. I did research like I've never done before. When I was called in to come in for an interview, I had pages and pages and pages of research of my suffragettes about the time period, about the politicians at that time. So I went in for the interview and you know, I nailed it because I guess I just had the best research. Marty is an incredible collaborator. That was the first time I worked with him. I mean, he was so serious about every little detail and that's what makes him really such a great filmmaker. In the case of Boardwalk Empire, he showed us Splendor in the Grass. I wasn't quite sure why he would show us Splendor in the Grass because it wasn't really the right period. What it came down to is that he said, see these big scenes, see all these background people? The one very back in that corner, that person looks great, that person looks perfect. And I wanna make sure that on Boardwalk Empire that every single background person is treated like a principal actor because they have to look perfect because if they don't look perfect, the whole picture won't look perfect. And that really taught me a huge lesson. When you do a big period movie, you really have to make sure that every single detail is perfect. You all remember Jimmy Darmody? Welcome back. Jimmy. Yeah. Welcome, Welcome, home, Jimmy. Welcome yeah. back, kid. Yeah. Gave them Hun's hell, I heard. Sure did. You do realize if you choose to join us, uh, the work will be hard and the hours long, the results slow and agonizing, and we will see no shortage of death at our own hands. But the rewards. When I started prepping for the Nick, I pulled together photographs of paintings from American realists like Sargent and Eakins, who was really famous for these beautiful paintings of hospital theaters where all the doctors would sit in arena-like settings where the surgeries would take place. So I collected all these paintings and I invited my core team and for a week we tried to copy these portraits to learn about color, tones, highlights, lowlights, the mood, so we can take that and translate it onto our actors by making them up just like a painter would on the portrait. The tools that we used on the Nick and the makeup, we tried to really replicate products that women used back then. We got beeswax, we had a juicer, we made our own mascara, so we tried to keep everything as natural toned as possible. No crazy colors, just really colors and hues that weren't available back then and in nature. When the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Shakespeare. Your Majesty, Mr. Phineas T. Barnum and his oddities from America. When we started on The Greatest Showman, which was my most favorite job ever, personally, I'm still depressed that I'm not working on it, that it couldn't go on forever, but I gotta let that go. When we started on The Greatest Showman, I started doing a lot of research about that time period, about all the oddities, and I put a great research book together. And then when Jerry Popolis, the hair designer, and I went to have our meeting with Michael Gracie, love him, director, the best, oh my God. We were like ready to show him all this great research we had, and he's like, we're not gonna do period. And we're like, oh, we're not? Okay. So he basically told us what I want for this movie. I want it to be period inspired, but I want it to be like a crazy fashion show. And Jerry and I were like, oh my God, this is amazing. Cause that's our strength. We can do period, we can do fashion. And this is like the perfect marriage of two things that we're really good at, that really excites us. It's super challenging, but it's also so creative. It was amazing. So rather than doing a lot of prosthetics to make it authentic, we wanted to show 
the beauty in them rather than the sad ugliness. And some of these looks were really challenging. For example, Dog Boy, we had to build like all these hair pieces and then glue in his face and incorporate them with a wig and everything. You know, for example, the tattooed guy, which we all know what he really looked like because he did exist, Prince Constantine as he was called. We had to make a suit for him because we couldn't put transfers on him every day because his skin couldn't have handled it and besides it would have taken us hours and hours just to you know, cover his body in tattoos. Everything we did was like handmade. Michael gave us such an amazing freedom to create, which I so appreciated. It was incredible. Did I tell you guys that I really loved working on that job? Come on, Murray. Do I look like the kind of clown that could start a movement? I killed those guys because they were awful. Everybody is awful these days. It's enough to make anyone crazy. Joker was a really challenging job. We met with Todd and we were talking about Joaquin. Not only what the look is going to be like, but how to best deal with Joaquin because he's going to have a really hard role to play. And so Todd showed us a photo of what they came up with they thought Joker should look like. And it was basically the working clown look, which is a very simple look. And from that look, we need to evolve him into Joker, which is like a version of that working clown look, but a very kind of distraught, messy, wilder version of it. And it's a little different to take a photograph and trying to replicate a design on a picture onto a person because sometimes certain colors may not work or the sizing may not work. So you really have to play and work out what the final design will be. And so what we did is like we had Joaquin come in for a couple of weeks to basically just play with the makeup until we got where we all felt like this is the right look. Again, this was a really amazing collaboration project. Todd, Joaquin and I coming up with this really cool look. You start him as Arthur Fleck, the working clown, and then slowly throughout the movie he gets degraded, 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 and then turns into the Joker, which is the final mad makeup look, which in itself had a lot of different stages as well, like being smeared, running away from the cops, arriving in Mary Franklin show, killing Murray Franklin, then being taken away in the police car, having a car crash, and then, you know, the resurrection. So these are all different stages within the same look. And that was really hard in terms of like continuity, because when you shoot a film, you don't really shoot scene one, and then you shoot scene two, three. We always shoot totally out of sequence. That means one day we actually started with a working look, and then we did a Joker look, in the middle of the Joker script where, you know, we hadn't had shot anything yet. We weren't quite sure we're going to do it like that. And it's really hard when you work that way because you have to be incredibly organized. You have to match everything you're doing. You have to go backwards, forwards. You need to know what's going to come even though you haven't done it yet. So it was really challenging. Joaquin was really incredible and the strategic way of keeping his makeup messy throughout the filming process is that I had to use different products that look the same when you put them on but have a different life on the skin meaning sometimes I needed the makeup to be able to smear when he touches it it would smear and sometimes I needed it to be staying put that even if he brushes up against something or touches it that it won't move and I needed that because of continuity reasons so I wouldn't have to constantly reset it there's this one scene the bathroom scene when after he kills the subway guys he runs into this bathroom and he does this incredible dance and he's all smeared so I had to match that smeared thing from when he shoots the subway guys but we shot this subway scene after we did the bathroom scene so I kind of had to make sure that I take a lot of pictures so I can recreate something that we haven't done yet, basically, right? But in that bathroom scene, he not only dances, but the scene goes on, which was cut out later from the movie, where he goes to the sink and washes off his face, and it was all one shot. So I had to redo it, like, I think 16 times. 
comes in, does the dance, washes his face, cut, okay, reset, I had five minutes to do it, do the makeup again, watching my pictures that I took to make sure that I copied exactly the same and then doing it over and over and over. So I had to use makeup that is really easy to wipe off or wash off so I could reset it. But there's other times when he's in the subway, I had to use makeup that had to look smeared but it had to be waterproof so I wouldn't have to reset it all the time because it would just take too long. If I had to go in between every single take to fix things differently, it would have taken too long. Joaquin would have never let me do it in the first place. So I had to be really creative with the materials I used. It was a really wild experience I had working on a job like that, creating such an iconic look. That was wild. Yeah, it was really wild and difficult and interesting and exciting. I'm really blessed with the projects that I worked on. When you find a crew that is very good in collaborating, it kind of is infectious. I find it also incredibly exciting and I'm really looking forward to see what will come next.